Okay, we're back. We're live. It's here on a Monday morning here in Honolulu, Hawaii, and we like to do international shows. We like sustainability. We like reducing fossil fuel and carbon. So we thought we'd go to Paris. And we're going to Paris through the eyes and ears of, of the uh, rain work, rain, make that the Rainforest Action Network, which is a nonprofit out of San Francisco, represented today by Amanda Starbuck. She joins us by Skype from Paris. Thanks for participating in Think Tech, Amanda. Hello, Jay. Thanks for having me on the show. That's great. We are very excited. We're calling this show direct uh, from COP21 in Paris. This is part of our series called Sustainable Hawaii. So tell us about uh, the Rainforest Action Network. What kind of an organization is that, and why is it in Paris? Well, the Rainforest Action Network, we're an environmental campaign organizer, and we're based in San Francisco, California. And our mission is to protect the rainforests and their inhabitants and to work to address climate change and the biggest drivers of climate change. And we're here in Paris because this week and last week, it's COP21, which is a global summit that is seeking to agree global climate action on climate change. It's the biggest conference on the topic ever in the world. Yes. Well, I, we really appreciate that. Uh, just for our listeners, I want to just tell them that uh, COP does not stand for a law enforcement agency, although maybe it should be. Uh -huh. It stands for a conference of parties, uh, and it's uh, the 21st such conference, and that makes it historic. And you've been there for several of these conferences already, haven't you, Amanda? That's right, that's right. So it's called COP21 because it is actually the 21st in the series of COPs. I, I haven't been to 21. I started going around COP6, which was oh, about 15 years ago. Um, and 21 conferences for people meeting the heads of state meetings for climate. I actually heard someone comment, it was a, a, an observer from Nigeria, commented last week, well, they should call it the conference of procrastinators. It's taken them so long. So uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is your role there? Are you uh, uh, one of the parties, so to speak? Do you have a voice there, or are you uh, more like an observer? Uh, no, no. No, that's a good question. So, you know, the, the, the parties are the official delegations from the government, um, or the, all the governments around the world. That's not what we're doing. We're here, we have observators, um, so we're here to represent one session. Many, many, many people here representing civil society. We're here to bring transparency and democracy to the process by following um, the negotiations as they go on, lending our expertise and support where we can, but also paying close attention to how our governments are negotiating on behalf of the U.S. and the people around the world. So, uh, you know, in, in, this, in this conference, we heard lots of public statements by public officials and national leaders at the, at the outset a week ago, um, and now it seems to have settled down uh, to the, the real work, if you will. And I wonder if you could give us a handle on how the conference is supposed to proceed. Uh, what, what, where, what's the uh, migration, so to speak, the evolution from those public statements by national leaders um, to what is happening now? Right. So COP21 has been run a little bit differently, well, significantly differently from how previous COPs have been run beforehand. The big difference this time around, well, there were two big differences. Um, Dr. Kim, who's head um, of the United Nations, asked every, um, sorry, not Dr. Kim, the head of the United Nations asked every country to be, come to COP21 with already agreed national commitment that their country was going to bring as the piece that they were going to do as their contribution to climate change. So what you've seen, and these have been rolling out all throughout 2015, every country has made their offer for what they're going to do. So here in the US, we had President Obama has put together a climate action plan that involves things like um, rapidly transitioning away from coal-fired um, coal power plants to um, big, big boosts for the renewable energy sector. Um, many countries have made commitments to the, um, a global a global fund for supporting climate um, development in developing countries. Um, and so at the beginning of this conference, all of those offers were already on the table. The second thing that was different at this conference is that we started off with the heads of state. We had 180 presidents, and leaders and kings and governors from all around the world came in and made their opening statements to the conference. And these have really served as instructions to the delegators, to the negotiators, to then do the work that is already mandated by their leaders. 
investors. So that's supposed to give a lot more momentum. Both of these things are supposed to give a lot more momentum and clarity at the start of the conference. So that was Monday and Tuesday last week that was going on. The rest of last week, we had the um, delegates, the negotiating team from the countries sitting down and working with all the counterparts from all around the world to get together a draft text and that's what came out this weekend mm -hmm. and then this week um, today the um, ministers the people who lead the environmental um, ministry or the sustainability ministry from each country came in to kick those discussions up to a higher level with the aim of getting an agreement that everyone has agreed on by Friday Friday is the day that people are aiming for well, you know, I, I'm I'm just uh, I'm not I'm not hearing the detail of what you're saying, but I I like to pursue the point of um, who is there. I mean, we have a world now where certain countries are obviously being responsible and accountable on this. Uh, certainly, you know, the U.S. and France and Britain and a lot of the EU, uh, some of the other countries, and I, I believe that China is active. I believe that India is active, but I'm wondering about the other uh, countries. Are, is is everybody represented? Are there any notable uh, absences. Is Russia involved? Uh, what about the Middle right. East? Uh, who's, who's there? Well, almost everybody is here. Um, 180 countries, that's a lot of participation. It is far more countries than have ever participated in these negotiations before. And I, I would honestly say there are very few, uh, there are no notable exceptions. There are a couple of countries whose leaders might not be here due to um, conflicts going on right now, but um, Vladimir Putin was here, the president of China was here. Um, these are all countries that are stepping up to engage. And that's one of, the, one of the perceived successes so far of the COP has been the level and the um, seniority of the engagement. That's really marked difference. Well, it strikes me, Amanda, that uh, if you put everybody in a room, it's only good. And they can talk to each other, meet each other, learn each other, um, you know, find common ground. And so uh, conceivably, and um, I don't know if you referred to this, but it comes to mind that this is also a platform for getting along in general and trying to make yeah. peace where we might have had contention before. That's a, that's a very good point. And I think that, you know, we've had, we have a lot of turmoil going on in the world of international relations at the moment. And climate change really is an issue. It's an opportunity for world leaders to demonstrate their capacity for finding peaceful solutions. We, we heard on Monday so many powerful speeches from leaders from around the world talking, for example, about how they wanted to be able to look their grandchildren in the face and tell them what they've done many years into the future. People talking, or pe um, presidents and from the low-lying nations in the Pacific talking about the very survival of their people. There were many, many statements of goodwill and intention. And if you were to listen to those alone, you would feel incredibly positive about the direction we were going in. Yeah, that's however, great. Go ahead. However, that's a great start, but the devil is in the detail. And whether, or, whether we can reach an agreement that really sets out a blueprint for a good future for this planet or whether we, we can't really rest on the ability of the negotiators to find a strong agreement between now and the end of this conference, or at least, at least the starting point to continue to strengthen as we go forward, because this is an issue we're going to continue to have to work on. Yeah, well, actually, this is more important than so many other things. This is the highest priority of humanity. Uh, and so if we could all get together on this, you know, maybe we could put some other more negative things aside. I mean, are you, are you uh, relating to um, management of these other countries, other representatives? Are, are you getting to talk to them, rub shoulders with them? Are you getting to, um, you know, work with them and, and, do, and draft with them um, and maybe have a cocktail with them? Could you repeat that question? Yeah. How much, how much uh, time are you having personally in the process? Uh, how much um, uh, contact are you having with the representatives of other countries and organizations? Yeah. Um, well, we've been really, really focused on what as a U.S.-based organization. We've been paying very, very close attention to what the U.S. is doing. But we've got friends here from many other countries around the world. We've got friends from Canada who are focusing on what the Canadians are doing, it's, uh, Australians, Australia, etc. So um, we've been tracking every day. We, it, there are a lot of very, very many side meetings. There are many issue meetings. So it's very hard for one organization to track everything. So we are talking with many other groups to hear what they're hearing. 
we're studying draft texts as they come out and then we're in constant meetings to work on where we need to push back are there things that we need to communicate to the u.s government or more importantly are there things that we need to communicate to the citizens of the u.s <laughs> so they can put pressure on the u.s government because after all that's who the u.s government is here to represent sure uh, let me ask also amanda you know is in, does anyone feeling fear of uh, further terrorism is there any discussion of that um, I, I imagine there's a lot of security, but how are people feeling about it? Are they afraid? You know, I mean, this is Paris, and the shocking events were only a few weeks ago. Um, you cannot avoid that here in this city. It's hanging very, very heavy over everyone, both the Brazilians who are having to live their day-to-day -day lives here and those of us who are just visiting for a couple of weeks. Um, the very first day that um, we arrived, the people from Rainforest Action Network we visited um, the Republic and the site of the, some of the, the shootings and saw the memorials and many of the world leaders as they came in also went to pay tribute. It was, it, it felt very important to acknowledge the, the, um, the extraordinary time that we're in right now and the pain the city's going in. Aside from that, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a very heavy police presence here in the city, the very militarized city. Any time you have 180 heads of state, you're going to have it. I mean, when President Obama comes to San Francisco, half the city shuts down. So imagine 180 heads of state and then imagine a time when you're fearful of a terror attack as well. So huge, huge police presence. There has been much criticism of the fact that um, President Hollande of France has um, called for an extraordinary state of an emergency. Not only are they on heightened lookout for terror attacks, which seems reasonable, they are also using this time to call for a, sh a clamp down on freedom of speech. And that is something that is really upsetting a lot of people. Um, most public protests have been forbidden. There was even the peaceful ones. There was a huge march that was planned for last Sunday, a peaceful march through the streets of Paris that was cancelled. Right now, they're saying any protest that involves more than two people is simply not allowed. Um, and we're hearing many, many reports of people peacefully protesting. And I'm talking about, you know, a few people holding up a banner, nothing more than that, um, getting aggressively stopped by police, arrested, put on charges. And that is really doing a lot to create a fear that democracy is being suppressed. It's very, very important that you know, civil society, that ordinary citizens are allowed to express how they feel, especially right now when so many world leaders are trying to decide all of our futures. So that, that is a real, real problem here in Paris right now. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, you know, we, we'll take a break in a minute, but before we do, I just want to get a precis on you. I want to find out uh, what you studied in school, where you studied, uh, and how, what got you into this business. This is very important business, and maybe other people who want to follow in your footsteps. So Amanda, tell us, give us a little bio, will you? Oh, my background, yes. Um, I studied uh, at university, I'm originally from London, um, and I studied at university in the United Kingdom. I, achieved, I studied politics and then went on to study environmental policy because growing up in London, I was very concerned about urban sprawl and what that was doing to countryside and nature. And over time, I've, as I went from thinking about urban sprawl issues and local, my local community, I became more and more aware about climate change and the impact that it would have on all of our communities. Um, so I've followed a path that took me for a few years working for the renewable energy industry um, into advocacy and campaigning. And now I'm very, very focused on energy and specifically how we can accelerate the transition we need to do away from fossil fuels, which are the biggest contributors to climate change high speed into clean, truly renewable energy like solar and wind power, because I, for me, that, that, that is one of the biggest single ways that we can address climate change. <laughs> it's nice to meet you, Amanda. And, and we're relying on you to continue this work on our behalf, uh, all of thank us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a short break now. Um, that's Amanda Starbuck. Uh, she's there at the uh, at COP21, COP21 in Paris, reporting to Think Tech. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Cindy Matsuki, and I host the show High Growth with HTDC on Think Tech Hawaii. This is the show where we talk about all things tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing, because there's so many things going on in Hawaii, and more people should know about them. So this is the program that you can come and find out about all the things happening in Hawaii. And this show also airs on Alolo 54, along with Think Tech Hawaii and it broadcasts live every, every other Tuesday at 3 p.m. 
So don't forget, check out the show Tuesday, 3 p.m. every other week. High growth with HTDC. Thanks. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Amanda Starbuck. Uh, she represents the uh, Rainforest uh, Action Network, uh, and she uh, joins us by Skype from Paris, where the, the conference, that is the uh, Conference of Parties, historic 21st Conference of Parties, uh, continues trying to solve the problems of climate change. So, you know, Amanda, what are the deliverables? You know, if I were, if I were here in Honolulu and I uh, had expectations, what should I be expecting out of this conference? Uh, now, that's a good question. What to expect and what you might hope for might be two different things here. Um, because I mentioned earlier how every country had made a national commitment coming into the COP, they call these the INDCs, we actually have a fair idea of what could be achievable. So based on the commitments that every country put down on the table, right now we can look for potentially um, an agreement on climate change at the COP21 in 2015 that gets us on track for about 2.7 to 3 degrees warming in temperature. Now, that's a problem because the um, world scientists are in pretty close consensus that the, the IPCC is the body that coordinates them. They are saying that in order to have a good chance of preventing the worst excesses of climate change, we need to be aiming for less than 2 degrees of temperature rise. Now, even that is pretty bad news if you're from, say, the Marshall Islands or Kiribati. I actually heard from the president of Kiribati this evening um, because anything more than 1.5 degrees and the sea level is going to rise so their nations don't even exist anymore. It, it would also be a terrible problem for sub-Saharan Africa who face extreme droughts and for many other more vulnerable regions of the world. So what we really would want to see is an agreement that gets us to less than 1.5 degrees of warming, or at least something on that pathway. Now, some promising news is we're hearing there's a possibility that there might be a preamble, like an introduction to the agreement that aspires for 1.5 degrees. But right now, the actual commitments that are being put down on the table are going to look more like 2.7 or 3. So. Yeah. Well, well I, I, wonder, I wonder if you're getting a lot of input from scientists. You know, we have a very strong school in uh, ocean and earth science here in Honolulu at the University of Hawaii in the Manoa campus. Remarkable scientists who collaborate all around the world. Um, and they focus on climate change. They focus on sea level rise. Of course, we are concerned about that. Um, but I wonder if they are there. I wonder if you have a significant uh, delegation from the scientific community who can act as your technical experts. There are many scientists here, and that's a good thing because they, they've been studying this topic. And there's an immense body of scientific work on climate change, and thousands and thousands of scientists around the world have been collaborating on what's called the IPCC reports. Um, and these are the ones that set out the actual latest peer-reviewed agreement on um, thinking around climate change. This is how they've come up with um, the thinking or the, the science that well, what will happen at 1.5 degrees warming, what will happen at 2 degrees warming. So it's actually set out quite clearly depending on what political agreement is reached and the action that follows, what consequences we are likely to see or likely to risk. Um, this has been an area of really credible cooperation. You know, uh, I, I um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, whether why anyone would object, oppose, uh, even try to limit the resolutions that would seek to reduce, uh, you know, carbon to the point where we can survive. Um, and yet, I sense that there is a fair tension uh, in COP21 between economic interests that uh, don't want to spend the money uh, to reduce carbon. Uh, and idealistic images, uh, interests like uh, the Rainforest uh, Action Network that, that really don't, that don't care too much about the cost of it because the cost is absolutely justified. Um, so what kind of tensions do you see? And who is expressing what, what point of view? And what countries or multinationals are speaking on the subject uh, to, limit, to limit the efforts in climate change? Right. Well, um, yeah, I mean, you've, you've really hit the nail on the head. This is the key, key crunch issue. Um, there, this is a moral imperative. And for, from my perspective, 
know, what president would not what president would not want to leave the legacy of being the person that was part of the global climate agreement? However, um, it means significant changes to business as usual. Addressing climate change really does mean huge transition in how we generate energy. Um, it's going to mean changes to consumption levels, especially in the global north, and it's going to mean very significant assistance to countries in the global south so that they can develop it in a sustainable way but also so the countries that are suffering the heaviest impacts of climate change are supported as they have to adapt to that as well. And this is all huge changes to business as usual. So the voices that are putting the spanner in the works of getting to the ambitious level of ambitious the people who have the most to lose from business as usual, people who have economic interests. Um, so in some cases, it's entire nations. So Imagine you're a Gulf state and your entire economy is based on oil, or um, perhaps you're Canada and you want to continue to exploit the tar sands. Um, a strong climate agreement really has the responsibility to do that. Um, there are also delegations that are clearly very influenced by the fossil fuel industry, don't in the US as one of them. Um, we're also seeing the European Union as well. Um, Australia are very heavily influenced by the coal industry. So. These are countries that might be showing leadership in some areas, but are showing real reluctance to make the level of ambition that we really want to see from these kind of heavily developed economies. Yeah. Do, you, do you hear the sound of countries and organizations that say, you know, we have economic problems already, uh, that we can't manage our debt, uh, we can't keep our infrastructure going, and you're asking us to, you know, contribute more, to pay more to pay more for renewable energy, to pay more for whatever, you know, additional steps are necessary. Um, and do they have any, do they, are they making that statement? And is it having any traction? Yeah. Um, it's, I, mean, I think the, the argument is, uh, is, is your, your economy does historically depend on um, oil, for example. The, the question that really needs addressing is what can we do as a, collab a planet collaborating together to help that transition. Just as we would say to a, you know, a region of the United States of Kentucky or West Virginia that needs to transition out of the coal economy, that we, sh we should be supporting them to you know, retrain workers, to develop alternative economies. We need to be thinking along those, 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 those lines as well for the countries um, especially uh, that have the most to lose from that. Um, what I'm hearing very loudly, clearly, um, I mean, I heard today from here, as I've heard it from the Maldives, um, is almost uh, an outrage at, that people are putting an economic interest as, uh, as on level with a human survival interest. Um, that's something that is deeply, deeply concerning. How do you, but how do you get um, people to, you know, write a check? How do you get a, a country to commit to spend money or to take certain steps that cost a lot of money? And how do you um, distribute the burden, so to speak? Um, will it be uh, from each according to his uh, ability? Um, and uh, will, will countries have options out? Uh, are some countries going to be the obvious leader? Uh, are some countries going to be the obvious follower? Uh, and how do you try to get parity on that? Well, it's, it, yeah, I think it is a case of each according to their means, and we're seeing a lot of countries coming forward. I mean, what is there, what, what is the, what's the incentive for a country like the U.S. or like the United Kingdom to do that? Well, there's actually business opportunities. There, there are um, opportunities to be had in helping um, another country develop a renewable energy economy or develop an energy efficiency or co new coastal infrastructure, whatever the thing might be. Um, but then there's also the, the concept you know, certain countries have done a lot more to contribute to the to the issue of climate change. Have historically released more emissions than others, so there's just really a fairness there that they should be the one to um, carry a heavier load in, in transitioning out as well. And then you see other countries that don't have so much to give from an economic perspective make really amazing offers in other ways. So the um, Government of Fiji, for example, has made an offer to take in refugees from other low-lying Pacific Islands when sea level rise. So that's the way that they are offering um, support as we do, as we do this issue together. You know, I'm I'm happy that you guys meet every year, and I I heard you say before we start that 
I think I heard you say that you'll go back, that this is part of your gig. And what, what interests me is the fact that the organization also acts kind of like a kind of like a cop, um, because when you come back after the end of the year, uh, you can do metrics on whether people abided by their promises, whether countries did what they were supposed to do, uh, and whether they achieved the goals they were supposed to achieve. Uh, so every year is a kind of review of how it went in that year. Do people see it that way? Is that the way the resolutions are being drafted? You know that we'll take another look at this next year as soon as we meet again? Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And that's, that's one of the key things that the United States government has been really pushing for within the talks is accountability and transparency around the implementations of everybody's commitments. Um, there's a big question, like uh, some, some countries have, are expected to do better than that at others. So what's the mechanism that we can use to make sure we all get to that level? Um, there's one key issue that's been um, talked about that I think fits onto the called ratcheting and this is the the concept that if we get an agreement this year at COP21 that commits globe collectively commits the countries to into a goal of 2.7 or 3 degrees warming a ratcheting would be saying that we're going to come back together um, in maybe it's, maybe it's one year maybe it's three years maybe it's five years and upping our ambition, increasing the level of our commitment so that we can get it down to two degrees, but eventually 1.5 degrees, because that's where we know we need to be. Mm -hmm. um, so this, there's this whole notion of ratcheting, and we've seen some countries very supportive of as early as 2016 increasing the level, the global commitment. And other countries, Russia, for example, are very reluctant to even have that conversation for at least five years. Um, so that's the, that's the big negotiation sticking point currently. Yeah. But we'll see which one that plays out. Yeah, you know, I wonder too, and the U.S. is not famous for ratifying environmental treaties. I give you as a, a sterling example the Kyoto um, Accord. <clears throat> and uh, still today, I don't think we've ratified that. And so you have a certain uh, constituency in Congress uh, that even now doesn't believe in climate change. And it can, that constituency, maybe with others, don't want to uh, actually ratify things. I don't know if that exists in other countries. I, I think we may be the leader in that. Uh, but I wonder, you know, what, what, what is the, the talk about ratification? And these resolutions uh, call for action indeed. That's, they're not too useful without a, a call for action. So what happens if a given country, if a given leader goes back and says, you know, would you please ratify this? And his, his parliamentary organization says, well, no, what happens? Well, it's going to be different. Every country's got its own different, slightly different working of, working of how the government and how the constitution works in their own country. Um, here in the United States, we've got a pretty bad reputation because under uh, George W. Bush's presidency, um, the United States was pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. And for a number of years, the United States did not participate fully in the COP negotiations. That has shifted under the current administration. Um, much of what is in the commitment that the United States has made are measures that are already in progress. Um, the, we saw the Clean Power Plan, which was about how, um, shutting down old coal-fired power plants and transitioning to less, um, less polluting forms of energy. That's already in the works. That's already, that's already moving. There are also many things that the president can do through executive action through executive order he can do with a stroke of his pen and don't these are things that do not need ratifying by congress um one of the actions that is not currently in the climate plan but rainforest action network would really like to see what urging the government or urging president obama to do is to end leasing of fossil fuels oil coal and gas on public land um here in the united states about a third of fossil fuels come from national forests even national parks and right now, um, they're getting auctioned off to oil, uh, um, coal and gas companies very, very cheaply. Um, and it's a big sort of carbon emission. Thing like that, the president could say, right, a moratorium, we're not going to do that anymore, which would be committing to keep that carbon in the ground and would go a considerable way um, up in our commitment on climate change. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a, we're going to take a short break again, uh, Amanda. Amanda Starbuck, she's with the Rainforest Action Network, and she's in Paris, and she's reporting to us from Paris about the COP21 talks. That is, the Conference of Parties, 21st time. We'll be right back after this short break.
Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward uh, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia, and by Asia we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world, uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. We're back. We're live. We're with Amanda Starbuck. She's in Paris. She's the Rain Action Network uh, Climate Change and Energy um, Program Director. Uh, it's a nonprofit out of San Francisco, and she goes to Paris every year for the uh, COP21, now the, the 21st time uh, for that conference uh, in Paris. So, uh, Amanda, uh, you know, can we get down, can we drill down a little bit into exactly uh, what these ultimate resolutions are going to call for? Uh, and how they are going to at least theoretically uh, pr protect us from climate change and what kind of you know metrics are involved and you know I, I heard a, I think I told you before that I heard a piece on NPR about uh, from a professor from Surrey commenting on the conference and he said you had to reach seven or eight percent every single year reduction of uh, carbon you had to keep on reducing and uh, just to keep it the same which uh, hopefully this year it'll It'll be, uh, you know, no increase, but that's not enough. You have to keep on dropping it if we want to save ourselves. So <clears throat> the question is, how do you achieve that by, by virtue of this process in Paris? What specific steps are these resolutions going to call for? What's the methodology? How do we get there uh, as a human race? Yeah, so the, your scientist that you quoted there is, is on the right, is, is, is in the, talking in the right direction. We absolutely do need to reduce carbon emissions um, and um, the question is do we all reduce by the same amount every year that seems incredibly unfair when you have um, countries already at very very different levels so US historically has emitted the most carbon but currently China is now emitting the most per year there are other high emitting countries the European Union um, India and the emissions are increasing a lot so the big question is who is allowed to continue to emit at high level? Who must reduce quickly? And what about countries that historically have emitted next to nothing? Surely they should allow they should be allowed for their economies to grow, but be supported in a way that their emissions don't get to the level that the north is as well. So there's a big mechanism there of who's going to who's, whose emissions are going to grow, but be supported and not grow massively, and who is going to continue to bring to, um, efficiencies either by cutting down what they do or having a better, better technology um, to bring that down. Um, so this is a really key thing. We need to have the accounting there and we need to have the transparency. Um, one way of doing this um, is requiring countries to report their emissions every year. It's also something that can be tracked. Um, for example, in the European Union, if uh, one of the member countries fails to meet their target, then um, they are reprimanded by the European Union and actually face a monetary fine. So that's one way that you can enforce it there. Um, other, th other, sorry, go for it. Well, it strikes me that there are different kinds of things you can do, and uh, for some things you get a huge return on your effort. For other things, it's a little more amorphous. For example, if I want to stop emissions from automobiles, I know I'm going to get a benefit out of that, and I can pretty much figure out what the costs are. They may be astronomical, but I, I can pre pretty much figure that out. Uh, the same thing with clean energy in general. If I, if I burn coal or oil, um, and then I change that to clean energy. I, I know pretty much that I'm going to reduce carbon by a lot. But they talk about trying to reduce the amount of carbon that goes into each dollar of economic activity. That's pretty immoral. That was the, the, the fellow from Surrey was talking about this morning. That we are inefficient in our economic activity. That we are, that with it, every dollar we generate, we're spending too much of it uh, or having too much carbon as a result of it. Um, and it's hard to actually find where that is and stamp it out. I mean, are these resolutions at that level of sophistication, or are we talking about emissions in gross? Um, it's very, the negotiations get into very sophisticated levels of detail once you get into the spine. Uh, the currently, the negotiation text is standing at about 50 pages, and there's an version of 50 pages. So if you're thinking of talking about describing all of the world's economic activity, 
you can't get into too much detail in 50 pages and certainly not in 20 pages. But then there are all these subgroups that spin off and different bodies that are tasked with addressing certain other angles that go into, into the, the vast detail. Now, talked talked quite a bit about energy emissions from energy. Um, that's really important. That's one of the biggest things that we need to address. We also need to be thinking about emissions from deforestation. Um, one of the most important carbon sinks that we have on the planet are in our forests. So it's not just about how we're making our energy, um, but a lot of the, um, the regions of the world which still have significant size forests, it's really important that those stay standing. So this is all part of the agreement as well. So how do we make sure that um, the Amazon, that Indonesia, that West Africa is supported to keep those forests such an important store of carbon standing at the same time when there's enormous economic pressure on these regions to deforest because industry, the forest industry, the palm oil industry wants to use yeah. that land for generating money. Now, I would offer you that whatever methodology is involved every year it will be more sophisticated. Those fellows from UH Manoa and elsewhere in the scientific community will have a better handle on exactly how climate change is, is operating and evolving or not. Uh, and that will, that will help uh, for future uh, COP uh, conferences. But let me, let me ask you this, I mean, where are we in the conference? Is, uh, are the resolutions out? Um, are they finalized? Are they ready for adoption, ratification? Where are we in the, what do we call it, the conference continuum? And when is the conference going to be over and what, we will, what will we see? Uh, we're getting to the end of Monday um, here in Paris. Uh, and these, these conferences run late, and some people work through the night in some of the groups. So, but we're getting to the end of Monday. We have four days left, four days left to get to the agreement. The possibility it might run a couple of days over. Some often these do, but right now the goal is to get the agreement by Friday. Um, in terms of where we've got to, um, on Saturday a draft text was released. It was a 50-page text that outlined the agreement, and then there was a 20-page abridgation. Um, these spelt out the main areas, um, and now people are going back and forth about what stays in, what gets added. One big concern, for example, was the omission of um, indigenous rights. Um, for the very first time, indigenous rights have actually been mentioned in the document, which is historic. Um, however, they're in the preamble, not in the text, and there are many um, people from indigenous communities, from First Nation communities around the world who are saying that is not acceptable, um, it needs to be in the main body, the rights of indigenous people um, need to be in this document, so that's the big sticking point. Human rights are also currently in the text, maybe, maybe not going to stay, um, so we're seeing um, many groups, including trade unions from around the world, that are strongly arguing and making the case that that needs to stay in there. Mm. Um, we have the issue of ratcheting, which I talked about earlier, like the, whether the agreement um, will be one that clearly states um, the, the commitment to keep getting stronger and stronger, and how soon that happens, the date fixed to it. And then, of course, um, the whether or not we're going to include um, that ultimately our goal is a 1.5 degree um, goal for uh, less than 1.5 degree warming. That's that's something that currently we're hoping is going to be in there. We'll see if it we'll see if it makes it. So, it's, is it one big agreement or multiple agreements? Um, it's yeah. It will be one big agreement on Friday, but consists of the many many um, commitments that the countries have made, and then it will be up to the countries to implement. So when you, uh, you leave, you leave in a few days, you go back to San Francisco, I guess. Will you continue to be involved in the aftermath of this conference, or will you be working on other things? Uh, well, we will return to San Francisco um, at the end of the week, um, hopefully with um, an agreement having been made that has set uh, a floor for stronger, stronger work to come. We, we think there's been big momentum around climate change, then we want to see that continue. But we're, we're, we're realistic that we will not have solved climate change. There's no way that we will have solved climate change by Friday. We will not have an agreement that is anywhere near as strong as it needs to be. Um, so our organization is going to be really focusing in for the future of what we can do back at home um, and how we can strengthen the U.S.'s commitment around climate. It's historically the biggest um, as a historically the biggest emitter, the U.S. has a really important role to play in historically being a leader in solving climate change too. And leader means 
taking really strong action. So we need to see that happen, not just words, but actual action. Yeah. Um, really, we're going to be focused on keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Well, here you are on the, on the cusp of it, um, of seeing it all emerge as um, you know, a result from the conference. And I, I want to ask you, I guess the ultimate question is, um, we have a serious problem in this world. Um, this conference may be our greatest hope. Um, is, the, is the conference a success? And will we be able to uh, reduce um, carbon 7 to 8% every year going forward uh, to save our planet? Uh, what are your, what are your uh, assessments on those points? Um, I want to optimistic about this. I know that the technology exists for us to reduce our carbon emissions through a combination of efficiencies and shifting our, co our consumption patterns, um, also technology transfer um, and shifting massively to renewable energies and making commitments around how we use our land. It is very possible to do this. Um, I'm not optimistic that we're going to get as far as we need to this week, but it's a starting point and we need, need to keep pushing. Well, bringing it down to the uh, local level, you know, in Hawaii, we have a kind of interesting uh, track on this. Uh, we started with a clean energy initiative in 2008, and everyone was on the same page looking for clean energy uh, and, and for larger, larger issues of, such as climate change. That was behind it. Um, now, there, another point has been insinuated into the conversation, that is cheap energy. And a lot of people feel that uh, clean energy is not going to work unless it's cheap. Um, so you have a tension on that going forward. And we pay a lot for electricity. We use a lot of oil and some coal. Uh, we have, on the other hand, we're growing a lot of photovoltaic too and other renewable sources. But still, the, you know, the, the problem for a lot of people is this is too expensive and uh, I don't want to pay more, even if I know, at least intellectually, that some of this money is going to go to build renewable infrastructure and, you know, and thus assist in the, you know, in the, in the resolution or the mm, dealing with climate change. So I, what I'd like to do is ask you, Amanda, speaking from Paris, what would you say to people in Hawaii? What would you say to them about climate change and how it affects them? What would you say about how this, this, this conference in Paris should be of interest to them? Well, I mean, when we're talking about climate change, change we're talking about the very survival of um, life as we know it and for many people it's the survival of their cultures um, and for others just the survival of it whether or not their lives will continue as usual um, on the issue of energy pricing um, the, the big challenge that we're facing uh, when we hear things like this is because we don't have a low playing field for the energy industries. Um, energies such as fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, and gas, are massively subsidized, whereas um, solar and wind are often not. Sometimes they are, but often um, Coal, oil, and gas are subsidized for the extraction, the leasing, the development, and those companies don't have to pay for the cleanup costs, the, the pollution costs, and the other impacts. Once they start to take out the subsidies that they receive and factor in cleanup, Suddenly, wind and solar are ma <coughs> massively better economically. Um, and these are um, energies that are getting cheaper and cheaper year on year. Um, I actually look at solar and wind as very, very good investments if you're thinking about somewhat of these finances. <laughs> so maybe think about it like that. Um, but and then also think about it on the moral level. Like when you turn the lights on and watch your TV, when you use your computer, do you want to be thinking think about where that energy comes on? What what are the impacts of that, and what will the impacts be for for your grandchildren? Uh, <laughs> thank you, man. I got one. My my final question for you before we we depart um, is is the the question out of uh, uh, Charles Dickens uh, and a, a Christmas story. It's the the ghost of uh, the future, the the ghost of the future. Um, so if I if I give you a great effort in Paris and a certain amount of, uh, you know, support from other countries around the world. But, but the program doesn't work. The people don't follow through on it. Um, that we don't reduce our carbon uh, emissions 7 to 8% a year and, uh, and, it, and carbon keeps going up and uh, climate change keeps happening and uh, global warming and all that. 
Um, this is the ghost of the Christmas future. Um, what happens? What happens to us? Have you thought about that? Yeah, well, there are many, and this is where science comes into play. What we're looking at, depending on how much we allow um, physical temperature to rise, we're going to see where I live in California, um, extreme drought, and we're already in year four of um, very, very full-on droughts. We're going to see more bushfires, forest fires. Um, we're going to see sea level rising. That's going to affect anyone who lives in low-lying area. We're going to see more extreme weather. Um, we're going to see huge desertifications and um, across um, southern Africa, um, Saharan Africa. Uh, we're going to see entire nations, places like the Maldives, places like Kiribati, places like Bangladesh, going underwater. Um, we're going to see, and that's going to result in huge shifts of population. We're going to see climate refugees. We're going to see more and more of that. So it will be huge disruption and change to the way that we live. And those are just human impacts. Once you get into talking about all of the impacts for ecosystems, for animals, for the oceans, um, we're going to see acidification in the oceans, we're going to see coral bleaching. Um, and these things are very, very fundamental, going to affect every level of the future. And the world will look very different. Amanda Starbuck, the Rainforest Action Network, reporting to us from Paris COP21. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you for having me on the show. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Aloha.